Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to this session, a rogues gallery, a Gerton miscellany. Um, the uh, authors today will present themselves. James? Uh, Carol, thank you. Hello, uh, my name is James Wade. Uh, I'm a, a, a fellow in English here. I'm the Jane Elizabeth Martin Fellow at this college. And I'm Carol Adlam, and I'm a visiting fellow, the Mar one of the Mary Amelia Cummins Harvey Fellows. Uh, this is actually my last day at Girton, so, uh, you know, <laughs> caught me at the very last time. Yeah. And uh, yes, we've been working on a book together. Yeah, and this is a book of uh, poetry and visual art about Girton College. So we've been thinking a lot about definitions, um, what kind of a book this is. And uh, first of all, I'd like to say that it isn't a document of record. <laughs> it's not a comprehensive account of Girton College. It is instead a set of meditations on the subject of Girton through time, created through a dialogue between art and poetry. And it's this sort of idea of, of dialogue that we really want to, to focus on here. Um, you know, one of the things that we that we've been thinking about is the way that dialogue is a source of, of, of tension, but also creativity. Um, and so we want to have a, a kind of non-hierarchical relationship between uh, visual art and, 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 and textual art, poetry. Um, and this is a problem that's sort of, sort of structured in, in, into, the, into the way we, that we think about the, these two categories of art, right? So if you have a caption um, that's, that, 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 that's referring to a work of visual art, then you have a hierarchical relationship between the caption um, and the visual art. On the other hand, if you have an illustration, then again, you create a hierarchy between um, the text um, and the visual image. And so what we're trying to do is sort of work against or to try to think through um, the ways that we can, yeah, that we can kind of disrupt those, um, those hierarchies and sort of think more organically um, about the way that um, the relationship between the visual and the textual um, can, can, can create tension, but also sort of catalyze new ideas. Um, and so the idea of entanglement, the idea of tension, the idea of, of, of sort of reciprocal dialogue um, is something that, that we've been focusing on. So what you're going to see today are images, quite a lot of images from my sketchbooks as I've been working over the last nine months or so in Girton College. Um, I counted up the other day, there were about 150, <laughs> all in various states of, uh, well, sketchiness or uh, completion, as, as, as you see fit. Um, some of these include people, so you will see some drawings of people you might recognize today, about 50, I've done about 55 drawings of people. But as I say, it's suggestive rather than comprehensive. Um, I'm going to show you a technique, one of the techniques I've used as well um, in when I first arrived, and that was in the height of pandemic times where it was very important to, to draw people very quickly, <laughs> so to come in and go out again as quickly as I could. Um, but I've used a wide range of techniques um, throughout this, this process, um, including, as I say, sketchbook material, but also I, I've been looking at the idea of palimpsest, so using layers, using found objects, so for instance, um, book plates in the library, which I have layered upon, as you can see on your left here, your right rather, um, on some of my drawings. Um, I'll be using photos from the archive as well. So you'll see quite a wide range of image, image making here. And part of the idea of that, is, as James was mentioning, is that idea of dialogue and also surprise. So the kind of element of surprise, that these are kind of open and unfinished artworks. So I'm going to show you here a process which I've called fugitive inking. And this, the, the, the video you'll see in a minute um, relates to a project that I've also been working on at Girton, but that I've carried across into this project too. And you'll also see uh, my cat in a starring role at the beginning.
So um, it, I, in, in a way that's very similar to uh, uh, Carol's sort of approach to her art, um, the, the, the poetry that I've been writing hasn't been, uh, I, I haven't been thinking about it in terms of, uh, uh, of sort of documentary record or mimesis or sort of direct relational um, correspondence with, um, we, you know, with, with the matter of the college, but rather um, I've been trying to sort of use um, experiences, occasions, circumstances, uh, chance encounters in the college as sort of catalysts for, for different kinds of thinking um, about my work um, and about my experiences here in the college. Um, and, 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 and I think that that carries over in this talk into what, um, you know, the, the, the poems that you'll hear and the images that you, you will see are not, um, strictly speaking, relational, right? That there is meant to be some, some, some fission, um, some tension created in the relationship between them. Um, and so I hope that we can sort of think about um, how, as in montage or as in the diptych, a third thing is created through that relationship. Um, but in going through um, the, 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 the very organic process, which has been this collaboration, um, uh, themes have, have emerged. Um, we've been thinking about trees, um, such as the tree outside the window. We've been thinking about boxes and time and time in boxes. We've been thinking about sort of um, optical devices and ways of seeing and ways of, uh, uh, you know, new ways or new, new technologies of seeing. Um, we've been thinking about animals, um, humans and other creatures around, around the college. And then thinking about sound as well. And I've been um, looking at different locations, not just in Girton itself, but emanating out of Girton. So um, I've been thinking about the work of Girton as it spills outwards into the world. And uh, I've been invited to all sorts of workplaces by fellows, including you know, the wheat fields of Nyab, which you may know on the A14, near but not too far away from us. Um, laboratories, greenhouses, computer labs, classrooms, stages. You know, I've, I've seen how Girton reaches out. And that's also given me opportunity to think about the built environment versus nature, interiors and exteriors as well. Um, so I'm thinking about liminal spaces, so space, spaces on thresholds as well. And the other theme that's emerged for me is this idea of Girton, an idea I had early on of Girton as a sort of citadel that sits on the edge of, of, a, of other spaces and that has wildness of different sorts all around it, including, as James said, trees that reach underneath the college, including underneath this very room that you see a kind of ghost version of it on, on the right-hand side here, an emptied out version uh, that we're sitting in now. Um, and, and, and similarly, um, I suppose some, some of my writing has, has emerged from these um, ephemeral and um, in many ways um, sort of happenstantial occasions. So, so instances in college where um, uh, there's been research evenings or just chance encounters, coffee with, with colleagues, um, um, interesting conversations with students that are unexpected. They usually are unexpected, or at least the interesting ones are. Um, and, and so it's really been sort of um, uh, opportunistic and organic in the way that, that, that my writing has emerged, um, and I think similarly with Carol's, Carol's art. Mm -hmm. So that's a little insight into the process. Um, but we're also thinking about the outcome. So what will this book look like in the end? We don't really know the answer to that yet. <laughs> but we're working with, uh, in a way, our third collaborator is going to be the designer and the, the printer, the, the, the publisher of this book. And, and we're very interested in thinking about the book, um, the kind of material properties and um, opportunities offered by this old technology, <laughs> the book form. Um, for me as an artist, that includes thinking about things like paper texture, weight, um, all those kind of haptic qualities when you pick up a book and enjoy looking at it. But also in terms of the ideas, we're thinking about the various ways into the book, that this is not going to be linear, but you have multiple opportunities to, um, uh, you know, to, to, to read the book in different ways. And I suppose that that... that that, that possibility of sort of thinking about the book as, a, as, as an interesting technology for, um, for, for creative engagement, right? That there are um, multiple in, in entry points and, 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 and escape routes and there's vestibules and there's places to dwell and pages to turn quickly. 
Um, and so, you know, we've been thinking about the book as a place that can hold or can house um, spaces of density, spaces of light, um, you know, that try to kind of, um, yeah, uh, sort of congregate sort of zones of intensity or its opposite. And so just thinking about the experience of engaging with the book where uh, it's the reader who's in, who's in control of how they, how they open and close and turn the pages and flip back and forth. And so we're trying to think creatively about, um, yeah, about that, about, about how, how we can put something into a reader's hands which will, which will encourage and sort of, yeah, motivate um, creative engagement. So we're thinking about this as an opportunity, in fact, for us to explore that idea of what the book might look like using you, good people, as our, um, <laughs> our test case. Um, where we, yes, and we're going to be so placing, as, as James will now read out some poems um, to you, we're going to be uh, juxtaposing these with, with different images that, as James said, don't necessarily correlate with what you'll hear, but we hope will spark some interesting associations. And we're going to start with people as a kind of broad theme. Um, so these, are again, are kind of sketchbook drawings of people captured around the college. And um, I spent quite a lot of time trying to persuade people that I'm not actually drawing portraits at all, <laughs> um, with limited success, of course, okay. but that I see them as objects and shapes and, 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 and as part of the, kind of the fabric, the living fabric of the college. So James's first poem is called The Librarian. And Jenny, Jenny Blackhurst, you may recognize her here, is, is the librarian. However, she's not in the room, but um, I'll just stress again that any resemblance to persons living or dead is entirely coincidental. <laughs> That's James yeah. Reese's yeah. poem. Yeah, yeah, stress that. I think it's been <laughs> yeah. recorded. Um, um, so this is a poem that emerged from uh, a, a poetry group meeting, um, which in the, the poetry group is a group that's been running for nearly 20 years in the college. Um, and it's uh, uh, student-led. The students organize the meetings. They organize the prompts or the steers that, that you know, rewrite re poems and read them out loud and, and discuss them. Um, and so this, this sort of had its origins in, in, in a prompt from, from one of the students. Um, and it's, a, um, its form is a guzzle, which is a medieval Persian form, uh, which is seeing some, some renaissance in, um, in the Anglophone world at the moment. Uh, and, and the guzzle has many sort of complicated rules for, for its so, you know, formal requirements. Um, but one of them is um, the repetition of a single word uh, in each couplet. Um, and so I've, I've, I've done my best to, um, you know, to, to stick to the guzzle form. Um, it's, we might call it modified. It goes like this, librarian. Does she even like books anymore, that librarian? Sure. Everything's hunky-dory on your first day as a librarian. But you can't be feeling too peachy keen when the date stamper goes dry and you're left alone to deal with the crisis as the librarian. Never turn a recreation into a profession, Isaac Walton said. But what else can deliver that bibliophiliac dopamine hit like a library can? Do baristas drink coffee before work? Do vets love their own pets? Each day in the factory is less and less satisfactory if you're a librarian. I once studied in a library that had 24-hour key card access. I would show up early in the mornings before the librarian. One morning, I walked in and everything felt somehow different. Eventually, it dawned on me that every book had been turned around spine inward. Then the librarian walked in she looked around, paused, looked at me, paused, and then exclaimed, we've been invaded by planet Tosser. Yeah. Poor librarian. The resident drinking society had got drunk and snuck in, and it took two whole weeks for the books to be turned back around by the lonely librarian. This other librarian I know would have been way more chill about it. Like, dude, those shelf marks really tie the room together, is something that librarian would say. Like, Open top water bottles? No problemo. Like late fees? No, market zero. After all, it's just a library, man. So <clears throat> another of the organizing principles we've been working with is place. And as I mentioned, I've been thinking about Girton as a series of liminal zones. Um, 
And this is the first, in fact, the very first drawing I made when I came here, which <laughs> some of you may recognize, it's the A14. And it says on it, uh, the North, the Midlands, which is where I live, so I, I drew it in a kind of moment of homesickness. And, I, um, uh, and, and so I've been thinking quite a lot about these kind of um, hidden spaces, unremarked upon spaces of Girton, um, what G James has called in one of his poems, interstitial vacuities, um, connecting spaces, stairs, beams, vaults, and so on, and also forgotten spaces or overlooked spaces. So there are mysterious huts hidden in trees, and you'll see some of these in my work for the book, maybe not today, but in the book itself. Um, there are trees covered in ivy. There's a sort of fairy, fairy tale uh, silhouette of the Grange, the artist in residence house, and the water tower if you stand on the cricket pitch at just the right position, so I recommend that. Um, there's the odd empty display window that nobody notices, such as the one by the Porter's Lodge, which has a fake, a little sad triangle of fake grass in it. And when I inquired what this was, the porter shrugged and said, it's just a void, <laughs> which was perfect for what I was <laughs> interested in. Um, and then there's the second orchard that perhaps people don't know about, the, the overgrown cherry orchard that is by the, gra the Grange as well. So on that idea of weighted spaces and overlooked liminal spaces. Um, James is now going to read another poem called Ovum. Um, probably the best poem uh, ever written about Girton College uh, is not this poem that I'm going to read you. It's a poem by Veronica Forrest Thompson <coughs> called Hyphen. Uh, and I thought that any, any project uh, 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 that involved poetry about or around Girton College ought to in some way sort of engage with, with, with that poem. Um, and I'm, you know, just about arrogant enough to do that. Um, and so I, 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 I wrote a poem about Hyphen Corridor, um, and it's this one. It was a flash storm kind of moment. You know the feeling, the telltale tingling creeping up the spine, the twitch in the fingertips, the volt fosse instinct to pause in the face of unexpected music. Real-time ellipsis of a refresh symbol spinning in the mind, the thumping pulse, the happening of an art inseparable from its form. I was in hyphen corridor, and the music came from within the closed door of a college-designated de practice room. Who was in there? What were they practicing for? And in that moment, I saw myself in the future, walking back from the library to which I was going, and in that return, I heard the future version of that musician now playing closer to their true and better and inevitable self. Like that bit in Bill and Ted's excellent adventure when the fledging rock stars go through years of intense musical training in the flash of an electric phone booth time machine and return to save the world through song. Or like Thomas Reimer, who went to fairyland to learn minstrelsy for a spell of 300 years that felt to him like three days, returning to transform his world through balladry. Then I thought of these practice rooms as giant eggs, eggs nestled by the warmth of hyphen corridor, eggs of unconscious growth, enclosing the metamorphosing musicians in protective waves of their own amniotic sound. And when the doors open, these musicians hatch fresh into a world remade by their changed selves being born into it. And then I thought about hyphen corridor. For what is a hyphen but an egg, an embryo in God's eternal present, ovum possibilium, a suspension of potentiality holding in perfect geometry the matter of that which is past and that which is to come. And sometimes my task has also been to think about the interaction between human and objects or the tools that they use, whether a violin, spreadsheets, um, computers, and so on. The tools they, they use to articulate Girton, to make and remake it every day. And um, so I've been thinking quite a lot about objects and in particular um, the un slightly unreal spaces that they can sometimes create too. Uh, even possibly quantum spaces, as we'll see later on. Um, but uh, 
to do with glass, reflection, and shadows. So we'll move now to the next poem, which is called Telescope. So this is um, a, a poem from a sequence that I've been working on, on optical prostheses, um, um, so to technologies of seeing um, that are instrumental in, in many of the disciplines um, that, 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 are, that, are, that, are, that are studied and engaged with in this college. Um, and, and I thought that a, a sequence on, on optical technologies, on, on sort of ways of image making, might, might sort of rhyme with um, poetry, which is also interested in, in, in sort of avant-garde sort of experimentation with image making. Um, and so I was thinking about the poetry of the imagists um, in the early 20th century. And so the, the idea of imagist poetry is to attempt to capture in an instant an emotional and intellectual complex. Um, and so that's what um, I'm trying to do in, in this poem here called Telescope. Rain, you beauties, you bodies of light, cataract in rivulets through the dense concavity of this objective lens. Now bend to a magnificence, gather to a concentration. So poised, so pressed under pressure of the vector, dart to the very inward thing. Pierce with distilled brilliance the cataract of a dull eye. Bending still, go deeper into the cavity of the subject, and deeper into the prison prism, the crystal ventricles absorb into the infinity mirror of the heart. And the last category of James's poems today is, is, is more to do with uh, abstract ideas. Um, those, some of those underpinning concepts I've been talking about today. Um, and they're really to do with, I've been trying to sort of think as well about paradoxes as well. So here, this is actually um, one of those fugitive inking drawings I talked about earlier on. It's made in the Whittle Laboratory and it's an enormous wind tunnel, at least the size of this room. Um, so I was thinking about how to capture movement and stasis at the same time. And the, the, the couple of images you'll also see here are also return to the, the question of how to capture time, um, time in a box, and also how to represent um, the ways in which we live alongside death. So James's poem is called Stick. And this is um, a poem that came out of, again, a, a, a prompt from the students for the poetry group. Um, and it's, I suppose it's uh, an attempt to to use objects to think about immaterial things, um, and, and, and also an, an experiment in, in rhyme. Um, you know, there's a, a, a very good poet once said that, that if rhyme is to be pleasurable, it must have some element of surprise. Um, and so that's what um, I'm attempting to do here, is surprise you. Silence, sound, leaf. Ground looming beneath, loam kilning its terra firma. Its terrifying firmness, just the slick surface of its terraform vivarium of carnivorous menace. Oh yes, just one perfect part of compounded risk. Like sharp mortared schist, like Petra's plosive kiss of compacted aggregates. Sudden silence with a mouthful of grist, while on high sits a pitched ground zero for chirping beaks an airy wreath in its airy niche, a nick meant for grafting in saplings, meant for twigs mixed with intricate foliage, arabesque interlaced, wound round like time, like a round wound, stented with sticks, meshed in tissue of down. Find the Fabergé by her sound, before feathers unfledged, before the flurry at the edge. Um, and, 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 and we're not done. There's some bonus material to come. Uh, doc, Dr. Megansani, do we have enough time? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Okay. Fantastic. Um, so uh, uh, Carol is not only a visual artist, but also a writer. Um, and so now we're going to um, flip roles here, and, and Carol is going uh, to, to, to read a poem for us. Um, and I suppose, you know, one of, one of the ways that we've 
we've been, I think we've touched on already, is a, a way of sort of conceptualizing this book is, is in terms of density, in terms of you know, thinking about sort of buildings as having a center and then a periphery, of thinking about trees as having a trunk, a dense core, and then um, uh, uh, branches that, that winnow out. Um, and, and so kind of thinking about extremities um, and their cores or the vice versa um, is, is, is something that we've been thinking about both in terms of the material object but also in the concept of the book. And so here is um, Carol engaging with, with ideas of, of, of centrality and, and periphery. Thank you. So um, this is a, a poem I wrote thinking about some of those earlier themes I explored to do with the edge of Girton, where its edges are. Also the idea of it as a sort of fairy queendom, um, an impossible but wondrous place. And um, so thinking about the kind of interactions between the different constituencies of the college, so fellows and staff, staff and students, staff and fellows, etc. And in particular, and not at all autobiographically, the experience of the visiting fellow who finds herself in this extraordinary uh, queendom, if I may call it that, um, with uh, glass mountains and fairy tale things happening uh, in its space. And I was thinking of the fate of such travellers once they eat the food and taste the drink. So my poem is called Only Food and Drink. Only food and drink purchased in the college may be consumed here. Oh, but I am haunted by that red-hot smoking peppery mackerel I smuggled in from Bar Hill Tesco. It was the time before. Whiskery mac lay in state in my eco mini fridge and I was down to my last stale breadcrumbs, which I tossed over my shoulder into the devil's eye as I walked the endless corridors. There I met a weeping boy. The hunk of cheese in his spotty hanky had lasted only so long. I told him there's a place on what they like to call a hill in these parts, and he set off, taking hero's strides up the glass mountain and across the A14. It was the before times, before I knew the word Eddington. <laughs> Two days in, and Mac still lay like Hermione, unmourned, bound in her Osiris net of labels reading best before October 24. I'd found the buttery coloured social hub by then. I'd tried a bap. I knew there must be more. I'd seen the shade of ghosts with takeout boxes vanish through the walls, so north by northwest I ran my ball of string between the pe people's portraits, from the eye of Mary Morris, post office assistant, to Trevor Tasker, cesspit emptier, and back again to the brother's pet, butchers. I saw it then, that crisscross motive light, the fold, the secret X where eyes converge, a small door, its iron key hanging from a white rabbit chain. I thought of Mac, her scales like Lenin's ears. That morning, I'd laid her to rest in an old kitchen's bin. Inside the glittering hall, red-eyed serving boys turned to me, whispering words like you pay and full commons and fellows account. I ate the food, au poivre, fricassé in jus, spirit poached and spatchcocked, I drank the wine. Tales flew of fistfights on the wine committee and stabbings in the kitchen. And then the gong rang out. There stood red-hot smoking mac, wrapped in chiffonades of chard. Benedicto Benedicata, she said. That was the before time. Since then, we eat and drink and tango until dawn. Mac holds me in her tight embrace. It's only food and drink, you know, she whispers in my ear. Um, and, 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 and we have one more thing for you. Um, this is, uh, it, it's a video actually, and it's a video that, that um, um, is, is so, sort of sums up the, the process for us. Um, it, it, it began as a, a, a talk uh, at a research evening by um, one of our colleagues, um, David Arvidsson Shakur, who's a, a quantum physicist. And he gave this talk, which I, I just completely couldn't understand, um, and went away to try and think about it. Um, and I thought that, well, one way of, you know, one way of, sort of trying to work through a, a problem is to, to write a poem about it, um, which is what I did. And then I showed the poem to David, and he didn't think it was completely bonkers. And then we were talking with 
with, with uh, Carol and I were talking with David and we thought, well, we could, we could make a video that, 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 that draws together um, the kind of the creativity of, of, of David's mathematics that he does on his chalkboard um, and, 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 and Carol's drawing um, and, and my words. And so what you're going to see is, is a, a, sort of a, a, a video that, that brings together um, those different kind of creative processes. Um, it's, um, the, 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 the title of the video is Gnarly Kankadort, um, which is a bit enigmatic. Um, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a phrase from Chaucer, um, which only exists in Chaucer, and we have no idea what it means. Um, so it becomes this sort of opportunity to, to, yeah, to, um, to, to, to think about um, that, which, yeah, that which is inexplicable. So the book will be finished next Wednesday at that speed. So. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and, and some of those uh, from the video will take stills and use them as images in the book as well. So, so they, that, that little video sums up that process of layering and sort of working in opposition and sort of in tension with each other and also generating uh, new images out of destroyed images <laughs> as well. Um, so it really just remains for us to thank people. <laughs> and on the boards here, you can see all the many people who have, have contributed to this project so far and, and, I, and, and made it, um, you know, the college is such a sort of lively and creative space. So it's been wonderful to work in. 
Um, so I'd, I'd like to thank the very many fellows and staff and students who have, who have offered me their time, who have put up with me, staring rudely at them as they work, as they eat, as they go about their business, and, um, and also to those who, to whom I still owe a drawing, uh, Simone. <laughs> and uh, yes, yeah. thank you. And uh, I mean, just to echo that, that note of thanks, and um, you know, my colleagues know now that you know anything they say to me, you know, can and will be used against them in a poem. Um, so it, it, it's, it, but it's been just such a, a, a fun experience. And in particular, um, we've, we've received tremendous encouragement from, um, from, from the mistress, from the bursar, and from the development director. Um, uh, but, but everyone is, has really just, um, yeah, been encouraging. And it's so important when you're trying to do something um, that's sort of pushing your boundaries um, to be to be, to be supported and encouraged and and, and Girton College um, it, it, you know does that best um, so we're yeah thankful to everyone. We have a little time for questions and so I have a microphone. Here we are. Hi, I'm Fiona. I was here started here in '74. I remember having coffee here on the first day. Uh, the question I wanted to ask you, because I'm a trustee of a, one of the leading contemporary art galleries in the country, and I went to a preview last night, and it had a big poem on the wall and lots of sculpture. And to me, today, you talking about the thoughts behind everything and you reading your poetry made it three-dimensional. And then when we had the video, it's four-dimensional. And how do you feel it's suddenly going to go back to being 2D in a book? Yeah, um, it's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I, I imagine that some of this material, that the videos will 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 accompany the book in some form, because of course we do have, uh, you know, the digital world is available to us to build a sort of, um, you know, a paratext, a sort of a structure around the book itself. Um, I, yes, that's, that is interesting. I think the the, the text. The, the poetry will be incorporated into the images um, in ways that we haven't shown here, but um, I will, I'll be working on that. So making the, the actual, um, the text, the lettering part of the, the design as well. And I think that, that idea of materiality um, and that, we, you know, we want this to be a book that when you pick it up, you, you, take, you take in information through your fingertips as well. Um, so in a way, that's a way we can replicate some of the, the sort of 3D or the multiple, multi-dimensional quality of, of the work. Um, I'm, I was just thinking, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a Chaucerian by trade, and there's a great moment in the first fragment of the Canterbury Tales where Chaucer is about to, to uh, offer us some objectionable material, and he says, well, if you, you, know, if you, don't, if you don't like what's coming, turn over, the, turn over the leaf and choose another tale. Um, and that's something, and of course the joke is that they can't because they, it's, all, it's all in performance, right? There's no, it, he's imagining a textuality that doesn't exist in the moment of performance. And I think that there, there, there are advantages and disadvantages, or there are things gained and things lost by each, by each medium, mm -hmm. right? From each mo mode of expression. And so there's, there are things that we can do dynamically with the reading of a poem overlaid with images in time here that will, will, will be lost in a, a, a print publication, but there will be things gained in a print publication. For instance, that the kind of the fixing of the dialogism between text and image, and the ways that we can sort of lead readers through a sequence of flipped pages, um, and 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 also the yeah, um, the, and the way that we can you know we have the possibility of zooming in or zooming out or overlaying text and image. So there's all sorts of possibilities there. Um, that 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 don't translate into into the screen or the live performance, yeah. which is just to say that it, it will be different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Any more questions? Oh yes. Um, so I mean, the beauty of today, because I love the poems and I love the illustrations, um, was your explanation of how you get that. Is there going to be some of that in the book or are you going to leave your um, readers to just explore and come to their own conclusions? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't think, well, I don't know. Well, it, we, we, well, haven't, we, haven't, <laughs> we haven't discussed that, I don't think. In, in the, we've had many discussions, but I mean, I would envisage there being some sort of um, guiding apparatus in the book itself, if not too directive. 
so yeah, we would we would have to think about how to yeah. do that. But I think I think it, that would be a useful and a, you know a productive part of 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 the uh, final art, uh, final book. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for asking that because we haven't actually talked no. about that. <laughs> 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 we'll, <laughs> so we'll go away. We'll, 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 we'll go away and think about it. But I, yeah, I suppose it'll, yeah. it will be sort of steering without directing, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, trying to yeah, trying to encourage that kind of creative re relationship without yeah. Orchestrating. Well, if there are no other questions, uh, I just would like to thank our two presenters, authors, artists today, uh, James Wade, fellow army chair in this queendom of Curtin, and most importantly, Carol, uh, on her last day for everything she has brought to this fairy, even more fairy tale to this queendom. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much, and all the best for the future, thank indeed. You. Come back soon. Thank you. Thank you.